Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, the issue of numeracy in health journalism is a vital one. Um, I should say that because I'm a writer, I write everything out. <laughs> so I've written this out. I don't have that many slides. And if I go too fast, I'd be happy to answer. I know there's a long uh, section set aside for um, answering questions. So I'd be happy to go over anything that I may have covered too quickly. Um, one of my former students sent me a cartoon about the coverage of science news that sums up some of the ways things can go wrong, which I'll share with you. An unscrutinized p-value, institutional spin, discarded caveats, exaggeration, discarded context, rapid turnaround, and your grandmother is wearing a hat with antenna. And I think, um, of course, it's a spoof, but the cartoon captures some of the problems with rapid press coverage of single studies. And it shows that these problems are familiar to many audiences, just as familiar as they are to many journalists. The idea, the issues of numeracy and medical reporting has been written about a great deal, and there are excellent books, reports, and studies to turn to. And I put some of them up there. I put a bunch of them up there so you didn't think that we haven't been paying a lot of attention to this. It remains an issue about which there is ongoing professional discussion and concern. As I was preparing this talk, I spoke to a manager at the Association of Health Healthcare Journalists, and he confirmed that numeracy and improving health reporting remain areas of high priority for the organization, areas in which they frequently do training and outreach. And he does not anticipate that will stop anytime soon, if ever. Journalism generally, not just in health and medical reporting, is relying increasingly on data analysis Numeracy and statistical savvy are increasingly important. Lila Hernandez asked me to talk today about the challenges journalists face in dealing with numbers in health reporting, some of the strategies journalists use or can use or should use, and to touch on the ethical issues that can arise as a result of how numbers are interpreted and presented by the press. I will start with the ethics. There are no definitive numbers that I could find on how many Americans get what proportion of their information about health from journalists. But it is clear from responses to news stories that many people do get and use health information presented by the media, and that media outlets respond to consumer demand by doing health stories, particularly those about personal health. Getting numbers wrong or creating hype has the potential to have significant consequences. People can make bad choices about care or treatments or lifestyle. They can opt out of, say, getting vaccines for their kids. They can feel false hope or great disappointment and no hope. For instance, they, instance, they can become desperate for a cancer drug that they later learn is not available or has only been tested in animals. They can waste money on medications that are Me Too's, that don't do anything different from another cheaper one already on the market. And they can drive research and funding into areas that might not have as significant public health implications as another. They can lose trust in science and medicine's ability or process to get at the truth. Most journalists are aware of the impact their stories can have, and they take that responsibility seriously. But that still doesn't th mean things work out right all the time. And that is because of the many challenges facing them. I have tried to, and a lot of them have come up already, and I have a slightly different language. I'm not coming at this, obviously, from an academic perspective. So I have a slightly different language to describe some of the ideas that have been already raised. Um, I put them, for simplicity's sake, into two categories. One is general or society-wide, not specific to journalists, but challenges for them alongside everyone else. And within that category, there are several main challenges. The first is the baseline challenge. Many, if not most people, readers, viewers, listeners, reporters, and editors alike have trouble with numbers or think they do. They see numbers in a quasi-paradoxical way. Numbers have great authority. They carry with them a sense of solidity of fact. If something can be numerically expressed, it seems to have heft, and as a result, it can be influential. It can also have a long life as an error. It can get cited over and over again and can mistakenly shape the public understanding of a topic. I will give an example of this later. As Daryl Huff put in How to Lie with Statistics, many a statistic is false on its face. It gets by only because the magic of numbers brings about a suspension of common sense. And yet, although people respect numbers and attribute power to them, they also disrespect them in a fundamental way. They want to have little communion with them, little intimacy. They admire them from afar, but they don't want to engage with them. We see, this result of, we see the result of this peculiar combination of skittishness and reverence 
in the fact that numbers continuously crop up in stories hand in hand with basic mathematical mistakes. A 2002 examination of one daily newspaper found, for instance, that almost half of the stories, a total of 536, published over the course of a month included or required some kind of mathematical information or calculation. And the study also found that errors were prevalent in these and other stories. The author identified, I think, 11 different kinds of mistakes, including incorrect addition, misinterpretation of numbers, sensationalization using big, dramatic numbers, unquestioning use of figures. Many errors were of elementary math, errors that common sense could easily catch, but few of the reporters or editors had turned their common sense to the numbers. So basic prevalent attitudes towards math are one fundamental challenge. A second major challenge relates to inherent problems understanding scale and scalability. This might not be the best word or way in which to characterize the problem, and perhaps afterwards someone uh, can sort of maybe help me find a better language for this. But over the years, I have talked with many scientists about the challenges they face in communicating scale. They are generally talking about dimension, about size, and they note that people are good with the scales of everyday life. Sizes they can envision and relate to, sizes that have visceral meaning. The atomic world, the cosmic world, not so much. As researchers such as Gail Jones at North Carolina State University have shown, appreciating scale is a key to scientific thinking. Problems of scale vis-a-vis -vis dimension seem to extend to people's problems interpreting and contextualizing numerical health information. Numbers of cases or rates of disease are difficult to scale up or down in an accurate or meaningful way. A number can seem one way when you think about the people you know and interact with. If you try to think about that number with regard to the US population or the global population or to a subset of the population that has very specific characteristics, that number can have very different meaning. Few of us are able to move fluidly up and down those scales to see the personal picture and or the big picture both accurately. A third challenge relates, as has come up, to statistical thinking. Understanding probabilities, ranges, risks, and ratios for a start are a kind of mathematical skill or habit of mind that can be particularly challenging and non-intuitive. Again, this is true for the press and public alike. Many journalists know this is an important professional issue. Another 2002 study surveyed 165 journalists and found that 84% of the reporters, 96 of the respondents, never had training in how to understand health statistics and that a majority of them really wanted such training. Correct interpretation of statistics and the difference it can make are beautifully captured in an essay by Stephen Jay Gould, which he wrote in 1985, entitled The Median Isn't the Message. Many of you likely know that essay because it is such a helpful one in thinking about patience and numeracy. Gould writes of learning about his cancer diagnosis and di diving into the medical literature to discover that patients with his cancer have a median mortality of eight months. He notes that most people would probably read such a statement as, I will probably be dead in eight months. The very conclusion, he says, that must be avoided since it isn't so and since attitude matters so much. Gould goes on to explain that as a scientist, he understands variation as the reality and mean and median as the abstractions. So he wonders whether he might possibly be in the group of patients who will live longer than eight months, which he learns that he is. He then determines that the distribution is right skewed with a long tail, and so he may well have years beyond him, which he does. Gould explains statistics so clearly. His essay is a model of how to explain mean, median, skewing, and variation in terms that anyone can understand and not be put off by. And it stands out for that because such statistical clarity is rare. The essay also provides a wonderful reconciliation of what Gould calls the unfortunate and invalid separation between heart and mind or feeling and intellect, what others have described here and recently in studies about public perceptions of climate change information as the difference between the experiential processing system and the analytical processing system. The tension between these two ways of processing information is another challenge for covering health for reporters. So those are three of the challenges journalists face and share with society at large, limited math skills, problems with scaling, statistical skittishness. There are also challenges that, journal, that are journalism specific, and some of them are exacerbated in the current crisis. 
Many media outlets are losing money, laying off staff, and many reporters have to do a lot more in less time. The profession has always been driven by deadlines and intense competition, but now reporters and writers at many places have to be constantly producing content. According to a 2009 report on healthcare journalism, journalists said there was increasing emphasis on quick hit stories. There is often less time to be reflective and little incentive to pass on covering stories that have a news peg, i.e. they have just been published in a journal, instead of waiting and analyzing the numbers, the implications, and the context. The journal journalist culture is an additional challenge for the press. Science, health, and medical information largely comes from studies which are embargoed so as to create a news peg, a date when they are ripe, and to create buzz and often revenue for the journals themselves, journals that publish mostly studies that show positive results. And so daily journalists are embedded in a cycle that is nearly impossible to escape from if you want to keep pace with your competition. Even if a reporter wants to do all the due diligence, she or he might not have the time to. If you are on deadline, you can't interrogate a statistic too extensively. You might just have to go with it. There is little opportunity to think historically under those conditions, to take the time to look at the lineage of work in that field, and to try to understand where this finding fits, why it might not yet be right to write about. This culture does not favor an appreciation of medicine or science as incremental or uncertain. Stories loaded with caveats are not newsy. As Cohen, uh, who's written a lot about this in our field, notes in News and Numbers, the notion of tentativeness tends to drop out of reporting. In these conditions, most journalists do the best they can, and they set aside questions for examination in a longer story, perhaps a trend story. These more analytical, reflective pieces are often where issues get examined more deeply and with nuance, and where numeracy, I think, is handled in, in much clearer and better ways. So now for some strategies journalists use or should use, and that many journalism students are taught. I should say my emphasis at the moment is very much on journalism education. Um, we have graduate students who are getting MS degrees and MA degrees, and we are working very hard to figure out how they can do a better job reporting on science and medicine. And so some of the strategies I'm going to go over are not specific to numeracy, but they are generalizable to a way of thinking about approaching reporting on studies that has implications for numeracy and how numbers are interpreted. Um, I'm not going to go into graphics because that is a huge realm, but a well-done graphic can solve many problems of accurate depiction of numbers alongside a news story. There are certain guidelines for thinking about and writing about numbers in science and health coverage that arise in training sessions and classes in journalism schools in the reference works that journalists turn to, one of the gold standards being the book I mentioned before, News and Numbers. And today, websites that review the quality of science and medical stories and grade them have appeared, such as Health News Reviews, which outline these approaches and will likely have a salutary effect on coverage. The strategies are as follows. Be familiar with various types of studies and their limitations. So you, and by you I don't mean you all, I mean the royal you of journalists. Don't misrepresent or overinterpret the significance or implications of findings. This includes having a roster of basic questions you need to ask about any study, and then presenting to your audience the strengths and weaknesses of different species of studies, being transparent about how research works. It also means looking beyond the one study to see if there have been statistical reviews or meta-analyses in the field you are reporting on, so you can situate a new study's figures against the larger understanding and evidence. And it means finding ways of telling your audience over and over again, science is tentative, incremental, often wrong. Find a statistician you can rely on. At my school, we have the great fortune to have a statistician who used to work as a journalist teach classes on basic statistics. She will be speaking next. That basic training makes a huge difference. The students learn at least something about p-value, confidence intervals, relative risks, odd ratios, the importance of giving whole numbers, not just percentages, about bias and confounders. Turning into, turn, and I should say, they soak that up. They are so delighted to have that. And when they write back sort of about what they're doing in the field after they leave school, they talk a lot about the statistics and going deep into uh, health studies. 
Turning to a statistician is something many health reporters do. And interestingly, as news organizations evolve, there are ever more collaborations with statisticians and data experts in newsrooms. Um, at our school, we've just hired a, a full-time statistician and a data visualization expert who are working very closely with the other journalists on the faculty. Be transparent about numbers and present them in a variety of ways. Um, and I'm curious about, curious about this in the discussion because it seemed to be suggested before that presenting numbers in a lot of different ways might actually not be a good idea. But um, from our perspective, we're trying to find a way of resonating with the audience. So um, we try to give whole numbers and percentages relative and absolute risk. This is not as routine as it should be. A review of 500 news stories in 2008 found that only 18% gave both relative and absolute risk. Use language that is clear and logical. Don't wave the numbers around as if they will do the explaining instead of you. Most journalists present findings in different ways so a reader can grab hold of it in whichever way is most meaningful to them. Paul Rayburn, who assesses the press coverage of science for the Night Science Journalism Tracker, recently posted an excellent review of a story about suicide rates, which described the rate as increasing by about 30% in 35 to 64-year-olds between 1999 and 2010, from 13.7 deaths per 100,000 to 17.6 deaths per 100,000. As Rayburn notes, a 30% increase sounds large, but the absolute number is 3.9, you can round to four more people per 100,000. And then he goes on to put the number yet another way, saying that despite the increase, suicide is rare, occurring in much less than 1% of middle-aged Americans. I've not, oops, I don't want to read that to you in the interest of time, which I'm already over. Um, maintain skepticism about the study and the numbers on all fronts. It can, and it can mean thinking about the history of a figure, not taking anything for granted. For instance, a lovely example of interrogating a statistic came up in a recent story in The Atlantic entitled, How Long Can You Wait to Have a Baby? The story looks at the assumptions underlying fertility, some of the statistics that have been widespread and that have shaped women's expectations and life choices. The author noted that most of the sources she turned to said that one third of women between 35 and 39 would not be able to get pregnant within a year of trying, and that women in their late 30s had a 30% chance of never having a child. These are figures some women I know are quite familiar with. But she probed them and discovered that the numbers came from birth, French birth records between 1670 and 1830. As the author notes, surprisingly few well-designed studies of female age and natural fertility include women born in the 20th century, but those that do tend to paint a more optimistic picture. There's also the strategy of turning over a statistic to see what lies underneath. One of the most exciting stories I listened to recently that just did this was a piece on This American Life. The journalist became obsessed about the stunning number of Americans on federal disability and how that number had almost doubled in the last 15 years to 14 million. And that these disability figures are not included in the country's unemployment statistics. She blended the statistics and stories of people and places in a compelling way, which brings me to another strategy and really pretty much the most, in some ways, the most important. Um, telling stories that capture data and human experience in the way that Gould talks about, the way that Dr. Davis presented that bring together the various ways we learn and process information. Many, many journalists do this beautifully when they have time and some space and support. A recent article about the challenge of changing people's minds about treatments or medical practice pointed out that, quote, the new evidence often, new evidence often meets with dismay or even outrage when it shifts recommendations away from popular practices or debunks widely held myths, beliefs, sorry. As many have noted, all of us force information, numbers, findings into the frame or mental model that we already have. It is hard for us to learn something that runs counter to our expectations. When journalists tell stories of individual experience with anecdotes and vignette, the complexity and nuance of the field or area of medicine can come to life. Numbers of all, and it can have a transformative effect. A final strategy, and just really because I like the penguins, is repeat as often as possible, correlation is not causation. I recently spent several years writing about a 19th century surveyor who was, to put it mildly, quantitatively obsessed. This man measured everything. He loved numbers. He was sure that if people could get the numbers right and could understand what they meant, society would be improved and progress would be guaranteed to the young American republic. 
Having facility with numeracy was highly valued and energetically encouraged during that era, as historian Patricia Cohen writes in A Calculating People. But my guide to quantitative skills to an extreme, he weighed everything. He knew how much his tent weighed when wet and when dry, same for his cot, same for his blanket. He filled pamphlets and letters with numbers, measurements, and calculations, and newspapers from Albany to New York to Delaware printed them and then printed his corrections of their numerical errors. Quantitative tendencies can go too far, and I would not want to open a newspaper today to see some of the intense, unrelenting numerical analyses that my 19th century counterparts did. But engaging with numbers, getting them right, understanding their implications, and then laying them out in the public realm in all journalistic media is indeed a greater good and benefit for society. That still holds true. And if any of my numbers or calculations are wrong, I blame deadline pressure. Thank you.